All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for the fourth episode of uh, Waterwatch's summer webinar series. Um, I'm Neil Brandt. I'm our development director here. And uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight with Master Fly Fisherman Dave Hughes and our Executive Director John DeVoe. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, you can feel free to ask questions throughout using the Q&A box at the bottom. Please stick around till the end of the presentation and we'll have a, a chance to have those questions answered on video here. Um, if you're having any issues or trouble connecting or seeing, please just drop me an email at neil at waterwatch.org. Um, I'm gonna put that in the chat here so any, everybody can see it. And um, with that, I will turn it over to our Waterwatch's executive director, John DeVoe, to uh, give us an introduction here. Thanks, Neil, and thank you, Dave, for being here tonight. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for the fourth in our webinar series this summer. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, practical trips for trout, tips for trout fishing tonight from Dave Hughes in part because September and October are right around the corner. And to me, that's the best time of year for trout fishing. <clears throat> Waterwatch, this is our 35th year, and our mission is to protect and restore stream flows for fish, wildlife, people who depend on healthy rivers. We also remove obsolete dams, and we secure balanced water policies that Oregon and the West need in a climate change world. You know, all of this work we do is really directly or indirectly, almost all of it, in service of trout and their brethren. And so we, uh, we feel very close to the angling community and uh, we're, we're grateful for their support. Um, John Gierak in his book, Sex, Death and Fly Fishing has a short story titled Expertizing in it. And in that story, Gierak shares his discomfort and unease as, with being called an expert on fly fishing particularly by people he has never fished with and particularly in front of his fishing buddies, who in other Gearak short stories needle John Gearak about his quote unquote expert status. I've never had the pleasure of fishing with Dave Hughes in person, though I do keep a copy of his pocket guide to Western hatches in my truck. And I don't know if his fishing buddies will give him a hard time for our promotional emails for this webinar, identifying Dave as a true master of fly fishing and the craft of fly fishing. Maybe Rick Haefeli will give him a hard time about it. I don't know. But it is true. Dave is in anyone's pantheon of fly fishing in the West, and we're lucky to have him here with us tonight. Dave is the author of more than 20 books about fly fishing for trout. They include, and I believe he has some of them behind him on the table there. You're uh, hit me by my name. <laughs> Wet Flies, Handbook of Hatches, Reading Trout Water, Essential Trout Flies, and the classic Western hatch Hatches with Rick Hayfley, the American Fly Tying Manual, Nymphs for Streams and Still Waters, Trout from Small Streams, and the book I love, The Pocket Guide to Western Hatches. Uh, Dave is also the author of the massive reference book, Trout Flies. <clears throat> His writing isn't limited to books. He's also had many articles appear in Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, Sports Afield, Gray Sporting Journal, Fly Fisherman, Fly Rod and Reel, Northwest Fly Fishing, and Fly Tire Magazines. He served as an editor of Fly Fishing and Time Journal for eight years, and he's currently a columnist for American Angler. Dave was born in Astoria, Oregon on the 4th of July in 1945. He worked his way through college, uh, at jobs specializing in the three Ds, dirty, difficult, and dangerous. He graduated from the University of Oregon in 1967 and from Infantry uh, Officer Candidate School in the Army in 1968. Dave served one and a half years in Vietnam, six months as a communications site commander in the Mekong Delta, and one year as a liaison officer to the Commanding General of Communications in the Southeast Asia Theater. Dave's con uh, conservation credentials are, are high class. He was a founding president of Oregon Trout in 1983, and he's uh, been awarded many conservation, literary, and other uh, awards from various fly organizations around the West and the nation. Um, he's a life member of his home club, the Rainland Flycasters in Astoria, Oregon. 
He's an accomplished amateur aquatic entomologist. His hobbies include collecting, identifying, and photographing the aquatic insects that are fed upon by trout, as well as tying and fishing the flies that match those insects and fool the trout. Dave's a resident of Portland with his wife, Japanese fly fishing writer Masako Tani. Uh, we're really honored to have you here tonight, Dave, and I'm going to turn it over to you and take it away. Well, if you called me a master, then I'm really in trouble with my friends. <laughs> and I can see Hakley's already made a comment, which means that he's here tonight, which is probably a bad thing. But um, I always say that life is an experiment and we don't know if it works yet. And that might be a bad introduction, but just as an example, Zoom is an experiment. I don't know if it works yet. This is the first one I've done. And last night at 10 o'clock, my computer went out and I spent two hours on the phone with um, Apple today getting my computer working again so that we could do this. So that's what I say of life is an experiment. We don't know if it works yet. Uh, we don't know if this works yet, but we'll get into it. And what I'm gonna talk about are what I consider the 10 critical skills in fly fishing for trout. And when I say 10 critical skills, I mean, the whole thing is all, all tangled up, these skills overlap, but it's useful to separate them out for pondering and practice. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna address them in reverse order. I'm gonna put the least critical first and the most critical last, uh, partly so that you have to wonder what I think is the most important one. But there's one that overrides all of the rest. So there's one skill that you need to know in trout fishing that's more important than any other, and that's whining. And if you don't have whining down as one of your skills, you're really shorting yourself. If you fish with guys like Rick Hayfley and Jim Schulmeyer, Ted Leeson, Richard Bunsey, our illustrator, they're all better than I am by far. And they've always got the right flies and they're always catching fish. And what I learned a long time ago is if you sidle up next to them and whine, they'll give you the right flies to go away. So you want to be able to whine to go get the right flies. And there's one thing that stands out in this skill is that you need to ask for two flies because if they just give you one, you're gonna lose it. You go back to whine them out of another one, it's not gonna work. They're just gonna tell you to go away and they're not gonna give you a fly. So the most important skill in fly fishing for trout is whining. And that's the one you need to work on the most. And, and I really recommend you work on it with Rick Hayfley if you, if you know Rick you meet him, just don't introduce yourself or anything else, just start whining. That's the best way to handle Rick. Um, so skill number 10, as I go through these backwards, I'm gonna call etiquette. Uh, etiquette is the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have Rick do unto you, um, but do it at a greater distance when it's related to fly fishing. And when I say a greater distance, a uh, cast or two, if you're on the Henry's Fork of the Snake and everybody's gathered around and they're fishing over, each person has a little individual pot of fish and you can work on those and you can be a cast or two from the other person that's working on his or her pot of fish and that's enough distance, but it's not enough distance everywhere. If you're on the Deschutes, um, maybe you need 100 or 200 yards. If somebody's in well, one of the famous riffles on the Deschutes is a boat there, there's two or three fishermen in it, you don't pull into that riffle you wait upstream until they're gone and then you pull into it and then it's yours for the duration of the time that you want to fish it. But you got to give them in that case, a hundred or 200 yards, maybe on some streams, a mile. Um, when I grew up, I grew up in Astoria down on the coast um, and we went fishing these little streams. And if somebody had fished that stream, we could see their wet footprints on the rocks ahead of us. We just went and found another stream. We didn't fish that stream. So, Give the appropriate distance to people when you're fly fishing. Uh, calculate their direction of travel. If they're moving upstream, you don't want to get ahead of them. You want to get behind them. Uh, always think in terms of keeping somebody's back to you if you're going to insert yourself into water that they're fishing. If they're fishing downstream, and this is more appropriate to summer steelhead fishing, but it applies to wet fly fishing too, then get in behind them. They're moving downstream. You want to move downstream behind them. I guess the way to think about this is always be in a position that if you hook a fish, they don't know you did it because you're going to be hooking fish behind them if you're better than they are and um, they won't know it. So if, if they're going in one direction, you stay behind them and don't get too close. Uh, keep moving. Don't get rooted in good water. If you're in a really good spot, 
and there's a whole bunch of people waiting to get into it, well, keep moving through it. Don't stand in one spot. And again, that applies more to summer steelhead than it does to trout fishing, but, but keep moving. Um, Rick has something he calls rutitis, and that's for your own benefit. Don't keep fishing the same water over and over. Keep moving because you want to show your flies to new trout. And never wait or float over somebody else's rising trout. If somebody's working over a rising trout or working over a spot, avoid going over that. And I'm thinking here more in terms of floating. I was on the Bighorn River once, I was fishing with Mike Schollmeyer, Jim Schollmeyer's older brother and bigger brother. He's bigger than Jim, believe it or not. Jim's pretty big. And um, a boat came down, they had just launched. They didn't really know what they were doing very well. And Jim, uh, Mike and I are floating over, a, a fishing over a pot of fish right in front of us. And this boat went right over them, right in front of me. Just, and, and one of them looked up and said, how's the fishing? And I said, well, it was pretty good until you went over my fish. And they got just ballistic angry. And they started yelling at me and they kept floating downstream. And I think those guys are still on the Bighorn River down around the corner yelling back at me, you son of a bitch, you know. But don't do that. Don't be the one that goes over somebody else's uh, rising fish. You can go behind them. It seems like you shouldn't get too close to people, but you can actually go behind them and leave their water undisturbed. So that's skill number 10, just uh, etiquette. Just think in terms of what you'd want done for you and do it to them. Skill number nine, playing and handling trout. And um, <clears throat> what I always say is release it fresh or kill it kindly. If you're gonna keep a fish, dispatch it right away. Uh, even clean it right away because it's gonna be better then, you know, it's gonna be better. To, but I don't say to kill fish. I just say, if you do fish, kill fish, kill them kindly. I guess another rule is if you kill fish, always open up the stomach and see what they've been eating because that sort of builds up your data bank of what fish eat, even if you don't see something that you need to match right at that moment. So um, release it fresh so it's still in good shape or kill it kindly. And in, in terms of playing trout, setting the hook, which is what it all starts with, you set the hook differently with the different fly types you're fishing with. If you're fishing a dry fly on a real small stream where the fish are quick, I'm thinking of Japan here, J Japanese fish just come up they either take the fly or miss it. You got to set the hook abruptly. In our country, most of the time you got to set it fairly fast on a small stream, small stream trout. But if you're fishing over rising fish, especially big ones, they're pretty ponderous. They come up and take a fly and tip back down. What you want to do is just raise your rod and say, are you out there? Just don't yank to set the hook. Just slowly raise your rod and seat the hook home if it's out there. The reason you do this is because if you set the hook abruptly, and it's not out there, it's not hooked, you rip the fly out of there and you scare the fish and you can't uh, come back and fish for it. So if you're fishing nymphs, most of the time you'll be fishing with indicators or in the urine nymphing with the cider. You wanna set the hook really quickly because by the time you see the indicator move or the cider move, things are almost over out there and you wanna set the hook pretty quickly. You wanna move that indicator and you also gotta move the flies to get the hook set. And one way to do that is to set the hook sideways. T turn your rod over and, and move it sideways because that moves the maximum amount of line and is most likely to move that indicator and that fly, which seats the hook home. If you're fishing wet flies down on the swing as you do for summer steelhead, do the same thing you do for summer steelhead. Just if you feel a fish, just wait until you feel the weight of the fish and then you set the hook slowly. Um, there's two reasons for that. Number one, if the fish is playing with the fly out there and hasn't got it in its mouth yet, then you've set the hook abruptly, you pull it away. Number two, if it's, if it's got the hook in its mouth and it's a big one, you break it off. So my assumption here is that you'd like to catch big fish. And if you'd like to catch the big ones, then set the hook slowly with wet flies because otherwise you break them off. If your streamer fishing on the other hand, you've usually got a fairly stout leader and you've got to move that hook into their mouth so you try to break their necks and that's where uh, George Daniel just wrote a book called strip set and what he's talking about there is you, you feel a strike on a streamer you strip set you move the thing as fast and abruptly as you can set the hook I don't do much strip setting but I do set the hook pretty abruptly with streamers so each different kind of fly again you set the hook differently uh, playing trout the main rule here is not really 
I'm not even trying to give you an advantage over the trout. I'm just saying how you get it over quick because you don't want the trout to fight too long. They build up lactic acid. They can die later. You want to get it over with, get them caught, get them released. So the way you do that is you give them the butt. And you give them whatever your rod's got. Give them the butt, especially if it's a big fish. And then number two, you make it fight the butt. But number two, you keep it off balance. Uh, if the fish starts to stay in one spot, tip your rod over one way or and then the other way and stuff. Keep that fish moving off balance. When you tip the rod over, it'll usually go moving. So um, get them moving. Get it over quick. Don't let lactic acid build up. And never rest the fish against the rod. And Rick and I, I think Rick might have been there, but we have a friend in Chile hooked about a 12 pound brown in a big, fast moving river. And he played that fish for about 20 minutes, a half an hour. But all he really did was he played it downstream from him and he just gave it the butt and he was brutal to the fish. But the truth is he was just letting the fish sleep down there on the end of his line. It never had to move. <laughs> he never moved it. He didn't tip his rod over one way or the other. So after he played it for long enough, he thought it was tired out and he took it into the shallows and tried to land it. And there was just this explosion. And I lived on the Mekong River for a few months in, in Vietnam. And these big lily pad rafts would come floating down from Cambodia. And the guards, they were Arvin guards, Vietnamese guards used to just lob hand grenades into those in case there were VC in them. And there'd be this great big explosion every once in a while while I'm trying to sleep. But that's exactly what happened to our friend in Chile. He tried to land this huge trout it had been resting on, on his line down there. And when he tried to land it, there was just this monstrous explosion and the fish blew out of there and got away with his flies. So um, don't rest your fish. Uh, give them the butt, tip them off balance, get it over quick and release them as soon as you can. When you're landing trout, whether you use a net or you don't use a net, keep them in the water. I typically don't use a net. I've landed a lot of fish. I still fumble, but I fumble with a net just as bad. But when you get the fish, restrain it by the tail, the wrist of the tail, and just cup it belly with your hand. Don't squeeze, just cup it. And then keep it in the water. If you want to take a picture, just hoist it out a few inches and it should be dripping when you take a picture. And if you've got small hands, don't squeeze the fish. I have lots of pictures of my favorite wife and she's got tiny hands and she squeezes fish. I guess I should mention that the reason I married my wife is because she's really small and in a picture she makes fish look big. So I, I married her for that because I was a writer and I wanted pictures of big fish and that was the easiest way to get them. So that's playing and handling trout. Get it over, get them back in the water, release them when they're ready to swim out of your hand. They'll tell you, they'll swim away and they're ready to go. Skill number eight is tackle and rigging. And um, when I think of tackle and rigging, I, I'm I used to be a hunter. I still am a hunter in theory. I'm not anymore because um, things got too heavy to carry. But that's, a, that's an aside. But think in terms of rods like rifles. People used to go on an African safari. They'd take a light, a medium, and a heavy. And think of this especially when you're buying rods because it can save you a lot of money on purchasing rods. Because you don't want to go out and buy six light rods and not have a medium or a heavy. You want to have a light and your light is a delicate rod for casting dry flies and emergers and et cetera over rising trout, feeding trout, whatever. It's your kind of rod that you use for delicate situations. It's an eight and a half to nine foot, three to four weight. And um, what you don't want to do is, and I've done this, I, I used to have about six of these and I didn't have anything stronger and it used to cause me a lot of trouble and I'll tell you in a minute. But um, so that's your light rod. You want to have a light rod. To me, that's my main rod. I use my light rod more than any other because I'm fishing in that manner more than any other way. Uh, your medium rod is kind of what I call an exploring rod. It's a steelhead rod, summer steelhead. It's a, it's a nymph rod it's for lakes. It's a casting tool. Your, your medium rod should be a really good casting tool. It suits you in terms of whether it's fast. I use a fast one, my wife uses a medium one. It just depends on your casting stroke. But you want your medium to be a, a five at the smallest. I use a six and um, it's a real casting tool and I use it a lot. I just got off the John Day River fishing for uh, smallmouth bass. That's what I use for that because the flies are pretty big. And it should have a lot of punch. That's for distance casting. You want that rod to be able to cover some ground. So that's your medium. 
Uh, your heavy is, is not used that much in trout fishing. It's used a little bit for um, nymph fishing and it's used for streamer fishing, but it's more for pike, light salt water, and that sort of thing. And this rod should be a beast. You really want a beast for your, for your heavy. If you get a heavy at all, you might not even want to get a heavy, but mine's an eight foot, I'm sorry, mine's a nine foot eight weight. And um, it is a real beast. And I used it not long ago on the White River down in um, Arkansas fishing streamers, big heavy streamers. And it was very good for that. But I don't use that much in, in um, trout fishing. But think in terms of getting a light, a medium and a heavy. And you'll reduce your expenses, believe it or not, by doing this. And specialty rods, I use a lot of small stream rods because I love small streams. I probably got 10 or 12 seven foot four weights, three or four of them are bamboo. And I go overboard on those. And some used to just kind of drift my way because people knew I loved them. And they love me, I think. I don't know, that might be taking it too far. <laughs> anyway, I've got a lot of small stream rods and some really, really good ones. And I use those quite a bit. And they should be seven foot four weights. They should be kind of brisk, a small stream rod. I don't believe in using one and two weights because they're too soft. And I want to make a brisk cast I'm fishing brushy streams, I want a tight loop, and I want to get my fly right where I want it. So I don't use soft rods. Uh, people always say if you're fishing a small stream, use a one or two weight. That's fine if it's an open small stream, but I grew up in Astoria. There's no such thing as an open small stream around Astoria. So, and in a lot of Oregon, that's true. Sorry, I have to drink my whiskey. Um, so that's rods, light and medium and a heavy reels. I like large arbor reels um, because they just let me reel um, less and, and um, want to make sure it holds the line plus 100 yards of backing, has a good drag. And um, that's my, um, any rod that I have, light and medium and heavy, they'll obviously be different reels, but they'll all have those same parameters. And um, always buy two extra spools when you get this maybe not for your light, you might get away with just a floating line, but if you travel much at all or you fish different situations, make sure you have a clear intermediate line and what I call a depth charge line. This is the fastest sinking head that my um, six weight rod will carry. And I just wanna be able to cover the different depths with a floating line first, clear intermediate covers maybe down to four or five feet. And then this is for any other depth that I wanna reach, including way down. So don't ever travel without one rod, probably your medium, that for which you have three lines. And you want a floating line, you want a clear intermediate, I do anyway, and then you want what I call a depth charge. You want those cover the bases and um, always make sure at least one of your rods um, it has those three lines. I don't have those three lines for my light rod, but I do for my medium and for my heavy. Um, Leaders, I just use seven and a half foot base leaders and three X, I buy them um, already made. And then I carry two X to six X tippet spools. And with that, I can build any leader I want. And I just find it simplifies my life, the amount of stuff I'm carrying. And if you know me, you know I like my life simple. And for example, knots, I should tell you about knots. I use an improved clinch, a non-slip loop, a surgeons. And my IQ, for some reason, I cannot learn a knot. It would take me two weeks to learn a knot sitting here in my office. And then if I got out on the stream, I'd forget it in about 15 minutes. So I just have to use just a few knots and I have to use them over and over. And that's the only way I can keep them in my head. And for all this gear, I, I wear a vest. I still carry a vest. There's lots of different ways to carry your stuff. <coughs> I carry all this stuff in a gear bag. It's always packed and ready. And I always pack, I can't show it to you. It's too heavy to lift. Uh, Hayfley and Schollmeyer, they just scorned me for the weight of my bag and the size of it. But the truth is, it's got everything in it that I might need. And I pack that after a trip, not before the next one. I put some trinkets in it that I might need for a specific trip. But I always have this bag packed. I'm ready to go out and grab that in my rod tube that has my two main rods in it. And I'm ready to go without forgetting anything. So um, that's tackle and rigging kind of basics. Uh, certainly buy all the stuff you want, get everything you want and everything, but make sure you have those basics. Uh, skill number seven is versatility. And just, I mean by versatility, I mean in both equipment and skills, 
outfish to fish all the different ways, dries, nymphs, wets, and streamers, and develop the skills to fish as many methods as you can. Um, I always say the more methods you know, the more situations you can solve. And um, for example, dry fly fishing, you want to have flies that cover fishing, just searching the water when nothing's going on. You want to learn how to search the water, read the water, drum up the trout, we call it. You also want to be able to match hatches. You want to be able to figure out what's going on and have the skill to match the hatch and make the cast and stuff that um, are required for matching the hatch. If you're fishing nymphs, learn to fish them on the swing, learn to fish them with indicator and shot. Uh, learn to fish nymphs with dry and dropper. That's a really good way to explore and figure. It offers trout two different kinds of flies, a dry fly and a nymph. Uh, Euro nymphing, I'm kind of experimenting with Euro nymphing right now. Rick is too, we just started. I, I'd say about Euro nymphing, we know enough to know that we can catch fish that way. In some situations, we catch quite a few fish that way. We've caught some big fish that way. And we also know that there's a lot more that we don't know than there is that we know. So we got a lot to learn. But that's true of all fly fishing. We got a lot to learn about all these methods. Um, I wrote a book on wet fly fishing and I'm considered somewhat of an expert at wet flies. And um, you want to learn to swing soft tackles. That's, that's a way to catch a lot of fish on soft tackles. It's a way to solve situations that dry flies don't and other kinds of flies don't. So learn to swing soft tackles. Uh, maybe you want to learn to fish flimps to rises when fish are taking emergers instead of feeding on the surface. Flimps can be really effective that way. You want to know how to fish a few winged wets for adult caddis. There's situations where trout look like they're feeding on the surface, but they're really taking winged uh, caddis underneath the surface because adult caddis, a lot of them dive down to the bottom to lay their eggs, and the trout take them more often under the surface than they do on the surface. A wet fly works better than a dry. So learn to recognize those situations and fish a wing wet. Um, streamers, um, there's different ways of fishing streamers. If the water's high and muddy, you want to go dredging the bottom. Um, I love to go banging the banks, like on the Big, Horn, Big Hole River in Montana. I like to bang the banks there. I can imagine on the Deschutes River, if you could do this, if you could fish out of the boat, it'd be devastating for a while. Uh, obviously, we can't do it there. But I like banging the banks even when I'm waiting. And I like picking the pockets as I'm uh, fishing streamers. So I've come more and more lately, I've been fishing streamers. And one reason is they catch fairly good sized fish. So um, I don't fish them a lot, but I'm prepared to fish them. So again, the more methods you know, the more situations you can solve, and the more trout you'll catch. So just an example here, I was fishing with two guides. Um, another thing I should point out, I did a book called Trout Rigs and Methods that um, has every different way of rigging and fishing that I could think of. So I was fishing with a couple of guides on the Green River on their day off in, in uh, Utah. And um, they just insisted on fishing the bottom with great big nymphs and they weren't really doing very well and they were having a really bad day. They were pretty grumpy. And I had a bamboo rod with me. I had a rod that wasn't very suitable for what they were doing and I just Sat in the boat, watched them a lot, tried to do a little bit, and didn't want to break my rod. They were using two great big BB shot. It was so pretty dramatic. We got to a riffle. I jumped out and tied on a soft tackle. I, I swung this soft tackle. It was a partridge in yellow. It was about a size 10, big one. And I had four fish in about five minutes or 10 minutes. And well, it was just this devastating method. I wish we could have done it all day, number one. And number two, the guides watched me catch those four fish. One was a four pounder. And they yelled, hey, Dave, we got to get out of here. <laughs> we're late to the ramp. And you know why they were doing They just didn't want to see me fishing soft tackles. It was so simple and so much fun. So again, learn the different methods and learn which method will solve the situation. And you'll not only catch more fish, you'll have more fun, which is fairly important. So, so skill number six is observation. And your observations when you're out there inform you which method will work best. You want to observe the conditions in the air. You know, what's the season? Is it winter, spring, summer, or fall? Is it cold, cool, average for the season? Is it warm or hot? Is it snowing, raining, blistering sun? And what I'm saying here, you don't stand there and look out in the distance and say, oh, it's winter. My golly, it's cold. I'm shivering. 
um, you just make sure that you're aware of these observations. You don't have to really make them as such. You know what is you know whether it's winter when you get leave the house, but uh, make sure you're aware of it because you're going to want to adjust what you're doing based on the conditions that you see. And again, observe the conditions of the water. Is it high and low? Is it clear and muddy? Is it warm and cold? Warm or cold? Because you're going to do something different based on that. If, if it's winter and the water's high, you're going to fish a nymph for maybe a streamer. If it's low and warm and insects are active, you're going to probably fish a dry fly. So observe the conditions of the air and the, and the season. Observe conditions of the water. And observe the insects, you know, and, and I always carry these little Nikon binoculars. Um, they do two things. Number one, you can see the insects. Sometimes you'll see insects and you'll think you're fishing over a hatch of size 12, let's say March Browns. And then you look through your binoculars, you can't catch a fish. You look through your binoculars and you see, wow, there's a whole fleet of little size 16, even 18 or 20 blue-wing olives mixed in that. Well, the trout seem to prefer the blue-wing olives. So with your binoculars, suddenly you're saying, wow, I need to change flies. So the other thing you can do is you can look downstream and if Hafley's catching fish, you can spy on him and see what he's doing. He won't tell you. So you spy on him and see what he's doing and see what he's using and you can use your binoculars that way. So they're very handy to have little binoculars with you. Um, again, you observe the uh, insects, are they absent? There's no insects, well, you're gonna want a nymph fish. Are they scattered? There's a few insects out, but they're not causing any activity. Are they are the insects active, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds? Then you, you can use uh, something like an elk hair caddis or a royal wolf or something. A trout will be active and they'll be looking for something that won't be selective. And then you wanna see if the insects are hatching uh, in a concentrated number of a certain species, well, then you gotta match that hatch. So observe the insects. And, and that's one of your observations and they'll tell you what you need to do. Observe the trout, you know, do you not see trout? Then you need to fish a nymph or something that you, or a big dry fly that drums them up. Are trout visible but holding? They're just not active. Uh, you want to do something different. Are fish rising? Then you obviously want to fish a dry fly or an emerger. Um, <clears throat> are they selectively feeding? Um, if they're selective again, you've got to match it. So observe the trout see what they're doing and uh, kind of observe your feelings about all this. You go out to a stream, if you're fairly experienced, then um, you'll feel whether you should fish nymphs, streamers, wet flies, or, or uh, dry flies. Just your feelings will eventually tell you. And your feelings are gonna be based on all these observations that you've made. And um, a couple of things, if you're fishing hatches, then I just wanna point out that uh, this old book that Rick and I did, and um, good luck finding it. It's out of print now. Western Hatch has had a really good run, kind of out of print. Um, and I, don't, I don't think you can buy, I know you can't buy a new one. I just dropped a rod. But if you can, it'd, it'd be a good book to start with on hatches um, or Pocket Guide to Western Hatches. So um, the one admonition in, in rigging, in observation is never rig up at home. Always, always choose what you're going to use when you get to the stream. Don't choose what you're going to use when you leave home. Um, choose what you're going to leave after you've made your observations, not before. Uh, just an example, my dad, my wonderful old dad, loved to fly fish the small streams around Astoria. And he always said, um, fishing is best when the sun is on the water. And he would only go fishing if the sun was on the water. He wouldn't go fishing if it's misting or raining or anything like that. What well, turned out to be far from true, especially if you fish hatches, um, the opposite is more often true. The fishing is best when the sun is not on the water. So um, observation is very important and it's very important not to stay home from going fishing just because the sun's not shining. Um, I used to live in Astoria. I'd, you know, it'd just be pouring rain and I'd say, I'm not gonna go to the Deschutes right now and fish in this weather. Well, I just realized, later, it's not raining over there. The weather's perfect over there. It's cloudy and the fish are rising and it would have been perfect to go. So I lost out on a lot of fishing days because of my dad. Anyway, skill number five, fly pattern selective selection. Uh, some people consider this the most important part. Some people consider it everything. Fly pattern is everything. I have a lot of friends that they, they always ask me, what fly am I catching fish on? And I'll show them, but 
it doesn't always matter. There's a lot of other things that matter. So the fly pattern's important, but it's just short of everything. Um, and um, ah, I'm knocking stuff over. Fly pattern selection augments versatility. Um, and you, what you want to do is you want to carry a small selection of each type of fly. I wrote this, Essential Trout Flies. My editor back east, I was sitting at her desk a few years ago and she said, how many copies do you think this sold? And I said, well, I think 10 or 15,000. She said 60. So she reprinted it and we had to update it, but um, got most of the flies you might want in there and all kinds of flies. Um, but you wanna carry a, a, a box of flies. You wanna carry a small box of dry flies that includes searching flies and hatch matching. I got my box here, you won't be able to see much when I open it up and show you, but this is my fly box. It's got nymphs and wets in it on one side and it's got dry flies. This, this is made to fish stone flies, um, searching flies, caddis flies, may flies, and then terrestrials. You can't see it very well, but this one box, that size and it's pretty light and it covers almost all of my um, dry fly fishing. In fact, there's a lot of times when I just take that box alone when I'm going fishing. And um, I've taken trips even to Chile with that one box and done pretty well, happily enough. So, but anyway, um, fly pattern selection, make sure you've got dry flies, you've got royal wolves, humpies, your favorite dry flies, your favorite searchers, and then you've got hatch matchers for mayflies, caddis, stoneflies, and terrestrials. And nymphs, um, I just use a few patterns of nymphs, very few in fact. And um, I carry this box and this box, um, on one side, it has most of the nymphs I use. And again, this won't show very well, but my salmon flies, golden stones, which are patch rubber legs, and then um, Frenchies and stuff like that, and smaller stuff down to beat us, really small stuff. It's got that on one side, and that's most of the nymphs I use. And then on the other side of the same box, I've got most of the wet flies that I use. So this is what I call my sunk fly box. And I'm pretty happy taking just that dry fly box I just showed and this box and I feel like I've got just about everything covered. So just a few flies at the core, at the basics, and um, that's what you need. Again, I carry the few wets, a few mostly soft tackles, a few flimps, a few wing wets, and I carry streamers to cover three depths. The first are unweighted, the muddler, etc. cetera. Um, no weight at all, so you can fish them really shallow just underneath the surface. Um, I use moderately weighted streamers to bang the banks and stuff like that. These usually be woolly buggers and stuff like that with tungsten bead heads, a little bit of weight. And then I use heavy ones, and these are usually clousers with the big lead eyes, and I want those to fish deep. So when you think in terms of streamers, don't think in terms of 30 patterns. Think of maybe three patterns that cover three different depths. Um, just shallow, unweighted, um, moderately weighted and then heavily weighted and then your streamers will serve you a lot better and you don't need to carry a lot of them, which I don't. I use very few streamers. In still waters, if you fish still waters, you want to have a separate still water fly box and I'm actually just tying this one. It was going to be my winter's project but I didn't get it done. But um, I just wanted to match all the different flies that I fish on still waters, surface and sunk, and then streamers and stuff like that over here. I haven't got it done, but uh, you want to carry a separate fly box for still waters because the food forms in still waters are different than they are in streams. So if you fish still waters a lot, you want to be going out there with a different fly box than you carry on the streams. So think in terms of that, midges, damsels, leeches, scuds, calabitas, um, a little bit different set of flies. So. And just to kind of confess here that I carry this boat bag and this is full of fly boxes and I can just barely lift it. And I promise you it never gets out of the boat or the rig, but it's got a lot of different boxes in there. So I've been condensing my fly boxes, what I call minimalisting, but I still have a ton of, ton of fly boxes in that thing. I should give it away or donate it or sell it or something, but it goes everywhere I go. It's got sunscreen, hand glo uh, sun gloves, and all kinds of other stuff too. But anyway, that's my boat bag. So that's fly pattern selection. Keep it minimalist, but make sure it covers all the different kinds of flies um, situations. Skill number four is presentation. 
And this could be the center of the whole program. It probably is the center of everything. Presentation is showing your fly to fish as if it's alive and looks good to eat. And every other skill that I've talked about and will talk about wraps into this as a part of it. And always remember that position is the most important part of presentation. Um, you get into the right position, you get conflicting currents behind you as much as you can, not between you and the fish. You do everything you can to get a good position to make your presentation from, and that's the most important part of presentation. Wade close and cast short. This achieves maximum control of your drift, your float, whatever you're doing, your swing, your retrieve. The shorter you cast, the more control you have, the more likely you're to catch fish. Um, Presentation is control, and most of control is mending line. You know what mending line is. You get a belly in your line, the line picks up the current and starts to drag your fly, and you just wanna flip out. If the current's going this way, you wanna flip upstream so that the belly goes in the different direction and has to go out and you get a drag-free drift again. Um, never forget that if you're fishing slow currents, you wanna make a downstream mend and that installs a belly in your line and the current picks that up and animates your fly and you get a better presentation. So mending can go both ways, upstream or down. Feeding line is always downstream and it's to extend the drift of a dry fly or maybe a nymph downstream fished on an indicator. Uh, into water you can't reach and if you think about the Deschutes River and you think about that alder tree hanging over a great big fish right along the bank, uh, most people fish it from downstream and try to poke a fly up under there and they catch the tree. But quite often you can get above the fish and make your cast above the fish and then feed line so that it, the fly goes down to the fish without drag. And that, that can be more effective on the Deschutes, which some of you probably fish, I hope so. Um, so feeding line, again, you can extend a dry fly float. You can extend a nymph drift. Um, when the indicator or, or the dry fly passes your position and you want to extend the drift, just turn a strip line off your reel and then wobble your rod so that the line lands right underneath the rod in S curves. And then as that feeds out, the current goes out and takes that and you'll get a drag free drift. And quite a ways that you can actually make a drag free drift downstream a lot farther than you can ever set the hook when you get a strike. So don't do it too far. And um, so that's skill number four, presentation. It's probably the core of the whole thing, and I don't cover it as much as I would because it's a part of all this other stuff. For example, the skill number three is casting, and obviously casting is part of presentation. And I always say I pay very little attention to casting myself, and many people pay most attention to it, and that's not a bad idea. Practice if you can. And I always say don't try to extend your distance when you're casting, try to extend your grace. And what I mean by that is learn to cast gracefully at a certain distance and then learn to cast longer by extending that grace instead of just struggling to cast farther. So, and my focus on trout fishing is to focus on casts that catch trout, I call it. Um, casts that catch trout are most often short, maximum control. I used to follow Lefty Cray at a, at a sportsman show, he's casting on the pond before I was, and he'd cast 120 feet off the end of the pond and everything. And I'd get up just after Lefty, and I loved Lefty, don't get me wrong, but I'd say, well, now that Lefty scared all the fish down to this end of the pond, I'll show you how to catch them. And what I meant by that is that most of your casts that catch trout are pretty short. You do wanna learn the basic casting stroke, and it's just um, load, you, you get your rod, and the lines in back of you are in front of you, and you want to load that against the rod so it's pulling against the rod. So you move your rod forward to load it, and then the rest of the stroke is power and stop. You load your rod, power and stop, and the rest of it is pretty abrupt. And you can't separate the power from the stop, they're just one part. But um, load, power and stop, load, power and stop, that's your casting stroke for almost any cast. And the first thing it requires a balanced outfit. Modern rods are pretty stiff and they're designed by tournament casters and they're typically over line because these guys wanna cast 120 feet. So what you wanna do, especially if you're fairly new to fishing is you wanna try any rod you buy, if it's a four weight, try it with a four, 
try it with a five. I've even seen four weights that take a six to be comfortable for me. It's a slow them down, I call it. But anyway, a lot of modern rods want to cast with one line weight up, but a lot of modern lines recognize this and they're making them heavier. So they're aligned just right. So it's very confusing, but when you buy a rod, make sure you try that rod with two or three lines in the shop. Make them, you know, they got lots of lines on reels so you can do this. And uh, make if you buy them online, it's one of the disadvantages of buying online is that when you get the rod, you've got to go out and get the lines to try it with different lines, but that's, that's part of life. So <clears throat> I recommend a fly shop for that. Um, but make sure your outfit is balanced. I was down in Tennessee one time and part of what I offered to this workshop was every person brought a, an outfit and brought it up to me and people came up to me and 50% of them I would cast and I'd say that just needs a line one weight heavier and you'll love it. And one time somebody came up and they had a weight forward line and it was spooled backwards and they couldn't cast because they're casting the running line. And I said, well, turn that line around you probably like your rod a little bit better so anyway keep that in mind so um the right grip for your rod is with your thumb on the spine some people use their finger on the spine but i could use a rod to show this but when you're doing this load power and stop if you've got your thumb on the back of the spine your thumb becomes the stop you just can't break it over as easily so get the right grip and then you can practice this load power and stop um, you can practice with a rod butt, just like I've got here, just the butt of the rod, and practice this while you're sitting at dinner. Practice it, um, you know, while you're watching the Blazer game. Um, I've recommended in the past that people practice it in church, but that hasn't gone over very well. But you could do that if you want. Practice it in church, but do the load, power, and stop. Load, power, and stop. And it doesn't show very well on the, the screen because it doesn't catch up fast enough. But practice that. And you'll be surprised that the practice that you do at home will improve your fishing on the stream just as much as fishing on the stream. So um, just really briefly, cast and catch trout is the basic stroke at 30 to 50 feet. Roll cast is the same stroke. You, you water load the rod and then you make that same stroke. Um, water loading, when you're water loading, especially in your own nymphing, you let your your water is the current's going this way. You let it take your line downstream, get it straightened out, and then you load it to get it moving, and then you power and stop. That's all. It's the same thing. Um, tilting the casting plane. If you got trees and shrub behind you, instead of doing load, power, and stop this way, where your line goes say parallel to the eaves of a house, you tip it down to do load, power, and stop, load, power, and stop with a tilt, and then your line goes like this and goes over the shrubs behind you and onto the water in front of you. Um, pile cast, I love the pile cast. Uh, for an eddy on the Deschutes, you just tower your line up into the air and then it comes accordioning down on the water and it just lands on the, on the eddy and you don't get a two or three foot drift, you get a two or three second drift instead of getting drag right, right away. So the pile cast is a way of fishing eddies or across currents that you just accordion your line down onto the water after you cast it almost straight into the air. Sidearm, just tilt that um, tilt that stroke over, load power and cast, but you're doing it sidearm, get underneath trees on the chutes. Uh, cross stream reach cast, you cast across the current, you cast straight, but as your line unfolds toward the fish, you tip your rod over, and then when it lines, it lands with the line from your rod tip down toward the fish, pretty bad to show it here, but you've got your line going at an angle down to the fish, and then you just follow it, you get a longer drift, <coughs> and a drag free drift that way. And of course the downstream mogul cast where you make your cast, your upstream, make your cast, wallow your rod, <coughs> and your, your line lands in S curves and then those S curves feed out and you get a drag free drift. <coughs> Sorry. One last thing on casting is learn to cast with your left hand. I'm pretty good with my left hand. I've done it for about 30, 40 years now. <coughs> and um, a guy named Hayfley, we were getting ready for a trip to Chile one time and we had a whole bunch of rods spooled up and lined out and he's left-handed. He picked up a rod in each hand and he just started going like this. And he taught his right hand how to fish in about 15 minutes. So if you really want to learn how to fish 
uh, left-handed if you're right-handed, right-handed if you're left-handed, take two rods, fairly similar rods, and start casting them like this. And you'll learn, it took me 30 years, it'll take you about 30 minutes. So I, I'm kind of jealous. But do learn to cast with either hand. It really opens up a lot of situations that you can fish. Um, solves wind problems, solves bank problems, solves all kinds of stuff. So skill number two, reading trout water. Um, I consider this probably very close to the most important skill, reading trout water. Uh, fishing where there are fish, not fishing where there's no fish, that's very important. Probably 20, 20 to 30 percent of the water holds almost all of the trout. There's a few of the rest of the water holds a few trout, but not many. Most of the rest of the water is empty. So if you start learning to hone in on that water that holds the trout, um, you're going to catch a lot more fish just because you're fishing where they are. You can double your catch if you start focusing where there's twice as many fish. It just makes sense. Um, good holding water meets um, three needs of the trout. It provides food, it gives shelter from fast currents, trout can't fight a fast current, and it gives protection from overhead predation. Ospreys, kingfishers when they're small, ospreys when they're bigger, um, I don't know what else. Um, but think in terms of the currents, because the currents deliver the food and they also carve the depths, and those depths are the pr are protection and the sheltering lies and stuff. And you think in terms of your currents, you look for interruptions because those interruptions define the lies. So you're looking for uh, current seams where two currents come together. You're looking for shelves where the uh, ripple breaks over a shelf and the trout are gonna be right below it. You're looking for ledges because the trout can hold down underneath them. Uh, looking for trenches, how do you spot a trench and say a ripple? If you see a ripple, it's got a, a rippled surface and then you see a slick in that surface, there's a trench underneath it, the bottom drops away and the surface smooths out. So you see that slick on the surface and a ripple, you wanna fish right down it because that's a trench underneath there and fish line up in the trench. Um, you wanna fish the deepest lines uh, because those give trout the most overhead protection. So the deepest lines, especially in a small or medium stream, will hold the trout. Obviously any boulders, um, if you see a boulder and you want to fish below it, uh, probably 20, 30 feet below it, what you're looking for is where the two currents that go around it come together. So not right behind the boulder, but downstream from it. And also fish right above it. Trout tend to hold on a little pillow of soft water right above a boulder. <clears throat> it's amazing how many times, especially on the Deschutes where you've got a boulder and you, your dry fly is up cast upstream and it just starts to build up over the boulder and a fish will just come up and take it right when it starts to lift up. It can be very entertaining because you can see that happen. Um, you look for, especially on the Deschutes, any indents in the bank. If you've got water or current coming along the bank, look for indentations in that bank because the trout will be holding back in those indents. Logs and stuff. Avoid frog water. Uh, frog water doesn't deliver food, and that's the overriding need. So fish avoid frog water. You don't find many fish in frog water, steelhead, trout, whatever. Find smallmouth bass in frog water. I just did that last week. It's a lot of fun. There's three ways to read trout water. Number one is look for rises. If you see rises, stop reading the water. You found the trout. Uh, collect what the trout are eating and try to match it. Go ahead and start catching them. The second way is to look for trout. If you see trout, well, you found them. You don't need to keep reading the water. So you look at what level they're at. If they're on the bottom down here across the bottom of the, I get my fingers in the right spot, across the bottom of the screen, then you want to fish nymphs or streamers. If they're up here in the mid depths, you want to fish wet flies or uh, suspend nymphs on a dry and dropper or swing them, whatever. You want to be very careful to see if they're rising subsurface, you'll see rises that look like they've taken on the surface, but if there's no bubble in those rise rings, then they fed subsurface and you want to fish with a wet fly or a dry and dropper, or you want to fish a, 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 an emerger that's a sunk emerger, not a, a floating emerger. And of course, if they're on, on the top, then you want to fish a dry fly. So again, when you spot trout, then look at the level they're at and fish that level appropriately. And the third way to read water is the way we think of reading the water is look for the ways the water meets the needs of the trout. And this is where you're looking for current seams and different ways the water shapes itself that tell you, oh, there'll be a fish holding there. And um, I read a book called Blink. And if you think about uh, reading trout water, 
you'll learn to read trout water just in a blink. You'll look at the water, you'll say there's a trout there. I love the subtitle of this is The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. And it really suits my IQ, I, I'd like to say. Um, it's really appropriate for me. But um, there's two aspects of learning to read trout water in a blink and they're based on education and experience and for education i'm going to say read read my book on reading trout water <laughs> don't read gladwell's he's not a fisherman a very good book blink is a very good book do read blink i highly recommend it so the first aspect is education read the book uh study reading trout water but the second thing that's more important is experience and then for experience you just go fishing and your brain builds up a data bank of what the water looked like when a trout took your fly. So you catch fish and you're not sitting there thinking, well, that water was such and such and so and so and et cetera. Your brain just kind of remembers what that water looked like. And the next time you see water that looks like that, you say, oh man, that looks like a spot where there'd be a fish. And indeed, based on blink, it's a spot where there's a fish. So um, the thing is just to go fishing and let your brain build up that data bank. <clears throat> So the last one, what is the most important skill in fly fishing? And in my opinion, the most important skill that you can develop in fly fishing is just to become predaceous. Think like a predator. Trout are predators, they eat insects. Become a predator yourself, and I won't say you'll eat trout, but you'll catch them. Um, so you simply go to the water, the stream, river, lake, pond, whatever it is, and you just desire to catch trout. You know you're gonna do it. And this reflects in your attitude and it doesn't necessarily reflect in aggression. You don't need to become aggressive, although that might not hurt, but I'm not aggressive, not very often. But it does reflect in your intent. You intend to catch the fish. You're really interested. So you start observing more and um, it, you're no longer, you can be casual, but you're kind of a focused casual. You're observing and seeing what's going on. You're a predator now. And it also reflects in your posture. You're no longer just laid back. I had a nephew that I fished with in Montana, uh, my brother's son. He's real tall and lanky. And he used to fish leaning back. And I used to think, I, I got to run back behind him and catch him before he falls over. And he'd be fishing like this. And he couldn't catch fish to, to, for anything. And he became a pretty good fisherman. And as he became a good fisherman, pretty soon his posture is leaning forward. And you know how you fish over a rising trout all day and your back aches? That's because you're a predator and you're thinking of catching those fish and you're intent on it, you're leaning forward. And it just reflects everything you're doing in your posture and in your thinking and everything else. And those observations of the trout and the conditions and your reactions to them. So think like a predator, you'll become a predator. You'll catch a lot more fish. Um, and... <clears throat> You use your own senses, mostly your sight. Um, you can see fish, you can see what they're doing, you can see what the insects are doing, you can, all of these things. And that's most of what you're using when you're a predator on trout. You can, sometimes you can hear rises on the Deschutes, so you hear a rise back under a tree and you say, wow, that's a big one back there. I wish I could get a fly in there. Um, use your sense of feel, feel the water temperature or whatever. But more important than that, you wanna honor the senses of the trout. The trout have their senses just like we do, and you have to honor those to catch them. And by that I mean keep out of their sight, um, stay back a little bit, wade close, but stay out of their sight, crouch, whatever you need to do. Don't wave your rod around right over their heads, you know, keep your rod off to the side, and make your presentation over them, but keep your rod from waving over the fish. Don't shuffle in the rocks and bang the rocks together. Don't bang the boat if you're in a boat. Um, <clears throat> keep the noise down. You can wade right up onto trout if you don't shuffle the rocks and don't make a lot of noise. Um, you can shout. The um, You can even shoot a gun in the air. Somebody did a uh, an experiment, Alfred Ronalds did an experiment where he fired off a shotgun right next to a fish that he could see and the fish didn't move. And the reason for that is that um, sound waves in the air don't transfer into sound waves in the water. So you can make all the noise you want you know, if somebody says, shut up, you're scaring the trout, tell them that's not true. You might want to shut up. <laughs> it's not because you're scaring the trout. And just one final recommendation, because a lot of you fish the Deschutes like I do. I got into an eddy on the Deschutes one time where the trout were just rising all the way down the eddy. And I had just put sunscreen on and I got upstream of these trout because I knew I need to fish down to them. That's part of presentation. 
fishing downstream to a really selective trout is better than fishing upstream to them because your line goes over their heads. I should have covered that in presentation. It's pretty important. But anyway, I had just put on sunscreen. I got out of the boat and I slipped into this eddy in the up, upstream end of the eddy. And I started wading down toward these trout and casting and they just blinked out as I got close to them. And I, I never caught a fish. And I finally realized that the scent of my sunscreen was maybe it was the scent of me. I probably hadn't taken a shower in a while. Anyway, the scent was going down and as it reached those trout, they'd quit rising and move off. And it was just out of range that they did this. It was a very interesting situation where these fish were really tuned into keeping away from me. And it was because I was let, my scent was going down and warning them I was coming. So be aware of that. Um, you're not a grizzly bear. We know salmon are scared of grizzly bears and they can smell them. So. Anyway, so that's it. Become a predator. Become predacious. It's very important that you just change your thinking a little bit and, and you'll focus in and you'll catch more trout. And I consider that the most important skill. And uh, <clears throat> conclusion, I've fished for way too long and um, I've caught a lot of fish, but I've also talked too long here. So um, just remember that these skills that I've talked about are all mixed together. I've separated them out. I've made 10 of them. There's probably 20 of them. Maybe there's four of them. I don't know. They're all mixed together. They all become one thing. And they become the skills of a predator who strangely goes out there fishing mostly for fun. So what kind of predators are we? We're not, um, not very successful ones in some ways because we're just catching fish for fun. Anyway, go fishing and have some fun. Take care of John, take care of Neil, take care of Water Watch so that we can continue to have these places to go fishing. And um, I've concluded. Thank you. I think. Fantastic. Who's in charge? Here? Who's in charge? I think you are. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, for, uh, great presentation. Uh, we've got a couple questions for you here if you want to keep your video on for just a minute. Um, uh, I had a couple folks email me actually earlier in the day asking questions, so I'll start with them, and then I think I see a couple others in the Q and A in the chat here. Um, so uh, the first question is from Dave Hollenbach, and he asks, uh, he says that he's new to fly fishing and he struggles with what types of setups he should be using. So he asks if you have an easy way of determining if you should use a dry fly versus a nymph versus a streamer. Well, that's a tough one. You know, I, I don't know what water you're fishing. And uh, that would be critical to it. And I don't know when you're fishing, but um, I, I think the critical thing here is to have a few dry flies, have a few nymphs, have a few wet flies, have a few streamers, and then fish according to what the situation demands. Um, obviously, if it's summer and it's warm and the fish are, you see a rise once in a while, you want to fish dry flies. <clears throat> and the one thing I'll say in, in response to this is, when you choose your tackle and when you choose your methods and when you choose this, find out what you like to do most. Figure out, I, I'm a dry fly, figure out I'm a dry fly fisherman or I like to fish wet flies. You know, I, I'm personally a wet fly fisherman. I'll fish wet flies when I probably shouldn't. Um, Rick fishes nymphs when he probably might be able to fish dry flies, but figure out what you like to do best and get the equipment that's perfect for what you like to do best instead of getting um, equipment that's best for what somebody else likes to do or that averages things out or whatever. Get a set of equipment for what you like to do best and apply that. But again, I don't know the water you're fishing um, and I don't know the situation you're fishing in. So I would say that learning to fish with dry flies is the easiest. Um, <clears throat> swinging soft tackles is probably the second easiest. Nymph fishing is fairly technical and requires a set of skills that might be farther down the road. So um, maybe I'm gonna say just based on that, dry fly fishing, how's that? Great, Oversimplifying. Yeah, fair enough. Um, you mentioned Rick and I have a couple of questions about Rick Hayfley. The first, I'll, I'll combine them both here. Uh, the first is a question from Bob Hunter asking, if it's true that Rick Hayfley is a fictional character created by you to help add some level of academic credence to your books. And then Ron Walp asks, if you could please share how you got to know Rick Hayfley and what that relationship has meant to you. Well, maybe I can combine my answers. <clears throat> um, am I showing on the screen here? Or my screen is blank. I think your video is off. So if you want to turn it back on, we can get you going again. It's fine. I don't care. I just was curious. Um, 
Well, Hafley. Hafley's an interesting character. Um, when I first became a writer for the magazines, mostly at that time, books later, I mostly write books anymore. I mostly don't write anymore because there's not the markets are worn. I don't have the, the um, I know Hafley's listening too. I see that <laughs> down here. Um, I know you're there, Ricky. Um, <clears throat> so I was becoming a writer and I wanted to write about the insects. I actually um, ordered a course in aquatic entomology at Oregon State. And, but my, the magazines I was writing for kept saying, you don't have any credibility, Dave. You, you know, you need to be an expert to write about the insects. So I made up an expert. I made up a person with a, a master's degree in aquatic entomology. I thought of this weird name, Rick Hayfley. And I kept writing co-authored articles with his name on them. But of course, there's no Rick Hayfley, so I'm cashing both checks. But um, as it went along, what happened was, they started asking Rick Hafley to give talks at clubs. And I actually had to come up with a real Rick Hafley. So I went down to Skid Row here in Portland and I found a bum laying in the gutter and I kind of hoisted him up and I slapped him a few times and woke him up. I took him home and gave him a shower. And <clears throat> I said, well, your name is Rick Hafley. You got a master's degree in aquatic entomology and, and um, when people want a book signed, you just sign your name to the book and don't talk to them or anything. But the guy enjoyed this role so much, he started going around to clubs pretending he was Rick Hafley. And I suspect that's Bob. Bob Hunter knows Rick pretty well now, but I suspect that Bob first met him when Rick had just come off the street. And um, in, in answer to the question of where I met Rick, um, I audited that course in aquatic entomology. I was down there studying healthcare administration at Oregon State. And I went to the professor, Norm Anderson, and I asked if I could audit his course in aquatic entomology. And the uh, <clears throat> Norm's assistant was Rick Hafley. And the way we became friends is I wanted to know about the insects. And I had a bamboo rod that Rick wanted to fish. And um, we traded, we went fishing together and I let him fish my bamboo rod and he showed me about the insects. And it spooled out from there and we're still fishing together, which is quite a surprise. I don't think we really like each other. We just kind of hang out together. I still got the, I, I actually made a huge mistake. I had two bamboo rods when Rick graduated with his master's degree. And one of them was a Granger, seven foot four weight. And I gave that to Rick for his graduation. And only later did I find out that Granger only made a handful of seven foot four ways. They made very few of them. They were really valuable. And I've tried to get that rod back, but I've never had any luck. Uh, Rick won't part with it. So he still lets me fish it. But uh, anyway, that's how I met Rick. One, right. one way is I invented him. The other way is I met him in an aquatic entomology course. Rick and I have had a lot of fun together, I think. He might disagree with that. So. Well, fantastic. Thank, thank you for the backstory there. Hi, Bob, by the way. <laughs> Bob Hunter. Um, the next question I have for you is from Milt McConnell, and he's asking, and this may be a controversial question, but Dave, what are your favorite Oregon small streams to fish with your three weight? Well, it's a four weight, number one. Number two, am I he hasn't read an angler's Astoria where I didn't name my small streams and the Oregonian reviewed an angler's Astoria and they got to chapter three where I said, I don't name my streams. And they gave it this absolutely horrifying review. They said, <laughs> what good is this book? It doesn't tell you where to go fishing. <laughs> so um, I'm reluctant to name my small streams. I could, um, you know, one of them is grassy Lake Creek. It's pretty much been logged to death. One of them is Young's river. I, I'll tell you, um, <clears throat> instead of answering specifically, all of my small coastal streams had waterfalls that blocked anadromous fish. And the reason for that isn't that I don't like anadromous fish, it's that those waterfalls block the migration of, of anadromous fish, salmon and steelhead, and what you caught above those waterfalls were native cutthroat trout, and that's what I was after. I wasn't after steelhead smolts salmon smolts and whatever. So without that waterfall blocking the anadromous fish, I didn't have the native cutthroat above. So I'm going to just say 
all of my favorite coastal streams had waterfalls and you can take it from there. You gotta go either look at the map for waterfalls or go find the waterfalls. But uh, the, my favorite streams were above those waterfalls. How's that for a kind of a, a evasive answer? Hey, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, the next question I have here is from Bob Schultz. Uh, he's asking, uh, do you get the impression that insect life on the Deschutes has changed dramatically due to the dam flows? And if yes, do you think it's impacting the fish population? Well, it impacts it very dramatically. The uh, Number one, the insect hatches have become compacted, and Rick knows this better than I do. I wish he was answering, but <clears throat> the hatches have been compacted into the, um, I'm gonna say um, a little bit toward the tag end of March, April and May, and then the early part of June, and then you trickle off into summer where you used to get these tremendous hatches of caddis and everything. You don't get the summer hatches you used to do, used to get. So yes, it has affected the hatches tremendously. I, I would say that, you know, I'm just gonna say that damn tower needs to be, get out of there. That's my opinion. Um, I always use the analogy and <clears throat> they put that tower in as an experiment. And I always say, view this as a medical experiment where the Deschutes River is your patient and you're doing this experiment. Well, the dam river is ex it's just about to expire from this experiment. Stop the experiment and then redevise the experiment and start over. But we got to get this thing stopped because the river Obviously the patient is just about to expire and it's not that dramatic. The Deschutes is not gonna expire. But we, we know that this experiment with the tower is deleterious to the fishing below the tower. And um, do something, stop it. But you know, I have this voice that doesn't get heard much. I don't know what your voice is. Anyway, um, yes, it's affecting the river. Is this affecting the fish populations? They tell me no. And um, I know people are still catching a lot of fish over there. Um, a couple of years ago, Rick and I did a, um, a um, what do you call it? A beneficial trip where, where people, people actually paid to fish with us. It was a, for Deschutes River Alliance. And I caught a huge fish. I caught 20, 21 inch rainbow. Very, very big fish. Not the biggest I've ever caught there, but still very big. I didn't catch as many fish as I would have expected. I think in my, experience the populations are down some people say the populations are not down the fish have moved into different kinds of water i don't know why they do that except maybe if the insects aren't as abundant as they used to be they're moving into different kinds of water to find food or something i don't know my own opinion is there are fewer fish um fish and wildlife's opinion is that there's just as many fish that are not in the same spots so i think i'm right anyway Great. Thanks, well, that's Dave. That's my answer. Wow. Uh, I've got one more question to finish us out. I think this is a good one. Um, Ron K is asking, do you prefer to fish alone or do you prefer to fish with friends? Oh, gosh. You know, well, I love my favorite wife, and she's a fly fisherman, too. She's a writer for the Japanese fly fishing magazines. Most of the time, I'm fishing with my wife. Uh, when I was younger, I fished alone a lot, almost exclusively. I uh, almost got killed several times on my little coastal streams down, you know, falling over backwards on rocks and stuff. Um, <clears throat> heavens, I don't get much time to fish alone anymore. I, I guess maybe I need to do an answer to that. I fish with my wife to fish with my wife. She's a very good friend. We have a good time together. Um, so most of it's a real pleasure. I get a chance to fish with Rick. Or friends, but, um, Sorry, Dave, we're losing a little bit of your audio I, here. I just got a, Can you repeat I just that got last a, bit? I said my internet connection is unstable. Pardon me? Uh, can you just repeat that last bit? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I don't remember what I said. And I like to fish with my wife. I think, I think that's Somebody about where we, where we could hear through. Can you hear me? Well, I think I 
think we're having connection issues with Dave. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to share a slide um, while we wait for him to come back here. Um, just to, to plug where you can get Dave's book. Uh, he's written he's written over 20 books, many of which have been talked about tonight. Um, he said the best place to find them is on Amazon if you search Dave Hughes. And here's a picture of uh, the book John referenced and Dave as well, Pocket Guide to Western Hatches. Um, also for those, for everybody who's tuned in, if you've been enjoying this webinar series and you enjoyed tonight's presentation, um, please do consider supporting WaterWatch's work uh, by joining as a member or renewing a membership. Um, I'm, this slide's a little out of date. This is for a previous webinar, but you can support by going to waterwatch.org slash donate. Um, so I'll leave that up while Dave's reconnecting here. Dave, when, whenever you're here, I think I see you popping back in. Just, just uh, speak and we'll see if the connection's working a little better. Well, I, I think we might have lost him again here. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in. I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, if you do have follow-up questions for Dave though, feel free to email them to me, neil at waterwatch.org and I'll, I'll pass them along to him um, and hope everybody enjoyed the talk tonight. Oh, are you back? Am I back? I don't know if I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Sorry, I, would, I was just wrapping it up, but um, yeah, if, if you'd like to, to just give your answer again to that question. Do you like to fish alone or, or with others? Um, that'd be great because I think folks had trouble hearing. Well, the older I get, the more I fish with my wife, the more I fish with friends. Um, the ones that are still willing to fish with me, I've whined enough that uh, a lot of people won't fish with me anymore. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I like fishing with other people. I like fishing with my wife. Um, she just opened the door to come in. She thinks I'm done. I think it's, I think I should say. Don't fish alone anymore. I think I'm still. You're coming in and out again, but um, to be. thank you. Thank you so much for joining I mean, us tonight. Thank you for the time. wonderful presentation. Um, I, I know I really enjoyed it and, uh, and we really appreciate you sharing your evening with us. You're welcome. I enjoyed it, I think. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much.